I didn't say clap for me. I said give Jesus Christ a big hand clap. <laughs> clap for him. Hallelujah. And he was all in my message. <laughs> because it, it's so important for us to learn what oneness is with God and how to actually be one with God. Because we can get so caught up in the ritualistic thing of coming to church every Sunday and never be one with God. We could come and we could hear the word being preached and never understand what it means to be one with God. And so I'm just going to go before the Lord in a word of prayer while I got y'all standing. And we're going to get to how to be one with God. Dear Heavenly Father, we truly thank you for being gathered here today, my Lord God. And let us not leave the same way we came in, but let us leave with a boldness, my Lord God, knowing that we are actually one with you, knowing that we are connected with you, oh God. And not let it just be an emotional thing, oh God, but it's in our spirit, my Lord God, that your spirit is dwelling on the inside of us and we can walk and live this life. As we give you all the glory, honor, and praise in the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Let the church say amen. Amen. You may be seated. You know, I know the cliche thing to say is that I'm not going to have you here all day. But but let's be honest, this is this is very important for us to actually not just say that we want with God, but really know what it means to be one with God. Because the Bible teaches us how can two walk together except they be in agree. And God <laughs> unfortunately for us, is not going to agree with our will. <laughs> He's not going to agree with your plans for your life. He's not going to come down and say, okay, well, if that's what you want to do. I agree with it. God don't work like that. He's not going to operate within your parameters. <laughs> He's going to bring you to his level for those who want to come. And the mindset that we have to take on is being one with God. It's really looking at Christ's life and taking a, a close look at the things that Christ endured while he was down here. And hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I'm going to start in. We're going to start in Isaiah 53. And it's just to give you... Um, well, one of the prophets spoke about Christ. And this is going to be Isaiah 53, verse uh, 1. And I don't want this to be a sad message. I want this to be hope. This is a message of hope. This is something that's obtainable. You know, this is something that we can actually do. You know, it may seem impossible with man, but it's possible with God. We can actually be one with Christ. And it's not something that's, oh, but Christ, he was holy. Three, We can do that. It's obtainable. It's for us. So don't be afraid when I say one with God, one with Christ. It, it's not difficult to do. And I truly... I, I got testimonies, man. I just truly thank God for this mindset that I have to truly be one with him. It wasn't, it wasn't hard when I really realized that it was for my benefit. Me being one with God didn't make me a weak man. Didn't make me, oh, I'm not hung drunk, man. I'm not sad because I'm one with God. I'm not sad because I don't go to the clubs or listen. None of that saddens me. I'm satisfied completely in him. He is my satisfaction. He's the reason why I get up in the morning. I smile every day, no matter what I'm going to face, because I got him on my side. I know that everywhere I go, I'm the majority automatically because I got God on my side. How do I know I got God? How do I know in my heart I got Is it a feeling that comes up on me to say, hey, you got God? Do I feel like it? It's not a feeling thing. Jesus made this statement. Jesus said, I know that the Father hears me because I always do those things which are pleasing to him. My heart <laughs> loves to please God. It doesn't matter the situation I'm placed in. If I have to suffer myself to be defrauded, I do it because 
It's about being connected with him. I can't do nothing outside of God. Nothing. Like I said, we're going to start in Isaiah 53, verse 1. It says, who had believed our report? And whom and to whom is the arm is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he should grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. And he had no form nor comeliness. And when he shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. You see how Christ is coming? He didn't first he said a root out of dry out of dry ground. Have you ever seen a root grow out of dry ground? <laughs> it, it's something that it's something that's hard to do. It's a hostile environment that he was growing up in, and he's a tender plant. He wasn't coming ugh, massive, aggressive, but he was tender. He came as a dove to the people. That's how he appeared. And people look at that as a weak thing, but Christ wasn't weak. <laughs> he wasn't weak. And here he is coming out of, and there's no comeliness about him. There's nothing that's attractive about him. There's nothing that, oh man, Christ is so beautiful. We just love on the outer appearance, but on the inside, he has something that people was just drawn to. People actually begin to be drawn to Christ because they can see his character. They begin to see his love. It wasn't something that immediately said, oh man, let's, let's go be, a, but they begin to hear about his love and they be, man. And they begin to hear about the miracles he's done. And that will begin to bring the people around him. And now he has multitudes of people following him. But there was no calmness or beauty to him. It wasn't something that was a, an attractive thing to the flesh. You had to really want God to be around Christ. Even though, we, even when he was around sinners. He was around the sinners that wanted God. He wasn't at a club or something, just hanging out with sinners. Oh, let no. These were people who wanted God into the church that were considered sinners because of their actions. But these were people who wanted to be saved. And those were the people that, that were surrounding him. And here he is, a root out of dry ground. Hostile environment. There is no beauty that anyone should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. <laughs> acquainted. Grief is his friend. Many sorrows. So when this life begins to hand us things that we, we can look back at Christ. Because he's able to comfort us because he didn't endure it all. He was rejected amongst his people. And in, in the book of John chapter 6, they rejected him. Isn't this Joseph's son? They didn't care about Christ. They rejected him. He went to Nazareth. He couldn't do many miracles there of his own people because they rejected him. Imagine how that felt to him. And the Bible says he's a man of many sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it was our faces from him. And he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he had borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of peace was all upon him and his, and by his stripes, we are healed. And that's the mind of Christ. These are the things that Christ endured while he was here. I mean, I mean, imagine obeying God throughout your whole life. And at the end, knowing that you got to die and you got to be, you got to die for people who you just healed, people who you helped all along, people who you cast out devils out of them, and these are the people that's going to crucify you. Imagine how he felt going through those trials, going through those things. And likewise, we have to have that same mind. That's why, hallelujah. That's why Peter began to say, thinking not strange. Concerning those fiery trials that are the try years, though some strange thing is happening to you. We got we to gotta be proved worthy. He began to tell one church in Revelations, buy me gold, try with the fire. I don't want to just, I don't care for lip service. Talk is cheap. I, I hear you say, oh, I love God. I love the Lord. Oh, God, you, you are my friend. You are, all, you are my all in all. But when you lose a job, ain't God still your all in all? 
When somebody break into your house, ain't God still your all in all? When a relative that's close to you just cut you off, I don't want to, I don't want to, ain't God still your all in all? And when you have that mindset of him being your all in all, that just brings you closer to him. That just connects you closer to God. And having that mindset has blessed me tremendously, honestly. You know, I got a promotion at my job and it, it don't mean I'm blessed. I'm just good at my job. But I'm only good at my job because I do everything is unto the Lord. Every time I go to work, I just do everything just to please God. I want to make sure on my job, I'm doing everything that pleases God. And it shows. I don't have to get on one leg and preach on people. People see my character. Like, man, it's it's something. Demetrius, uh, you a Christian? You you saved? Like, yeah, yeah. Man, it shows. It shows. It permeates. People can see that on you. You don't have to go preaching everywhere. People can see that in your work that people can see it all up on you when you serve God the right way. They don't see me complaining about the rules and regulations of the job. <laughs> they see me complying. They we had a um, we had a meeting, you know, because normally uh our supervisors we have to have a huddle meeting and everybody in there, oh, I get tired of getting QEMs and that's just they monitor your phone calls to make sure you're doing your job. And Oh, lucky go, happy me. I was like, well, they just making sure you're doing your job. Demetrius, you just always got to find the good in everything. <laughs> I, it's good in everything. I said they're just regulating us to make sure we do our jobs right. I said there's nothing wrong with that. But for me, it's a blessing because I know that I'm doing everything is unto God. That's my mindset. That's my heart desire. And it's for us to get to that point. And I'm like I said, I'm about to show you what it's gonna take. You know, so don't draw up, you know. If you can't say amen, say ouch. And and it's a message for us to truly examine ourselves to make sure that we are actually in the faith. Amen. So I'm, I'm gonna go to the book of John. We're gonna go to chapter 14. So the book of John chapter 14, and once you get it, say amen. But God has truly, man, God has truly been good to me. I just, I look over my life, and it's not about anything that I've accomplished, but his spirit dwelling on the inside of me, me being kind of worthy, it's just a blessing to me. It has done so much for my life, you know, Another testimony. Hallelujah. When you make God the head of all, it's so easy for him. It, you know, me and my wife, we are we have two completely different backgrounds. Two, she comes from a two-parent household. I come from a single-parent household. It's completely different. And you know, and I would think, man, you know, and it we still in year one. And I'm thinking, man, you know, it may be hard for us to to find a silver lining in this. But once we begin to say, you know, I begin to say, you know what? Put God in it. And I begin to put God all in my marriage, just all throughout my marriage, all throughout it. Just God and God, God, God all up in it. Me and my wife get along so well now. <laughs> Those first four, five months, I was like, man, God, woo, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> But now we get along so well. And, you know, one of my coworkers, she's been married for about five, six years. She's like, Demetrius, you know, it take about five, seven, eight years to, just for y'all to get along. And I'm like, it do? I guess me and my wife done beat the curve. <laughs> we ain't even made it out of year one, and we get along so well. Even in disagreements, there's no, I'm going to sleep on the couch and you sleep. There's none of that. Even in disagreements. And that's all because we put God first. When you put God all in your life, when I say let him get down to the marrow of your bones and your soul and your mind and your heart, he does everything. It's truly a resting position in Christ. He began to tell people, you know, us, come unto me. You are heavy laden and burdened down and I give you rest for your soul. When I say a rest in Christ, I can just lay back. (laughs) 
I'm relaxing right now. <laughs> I'm in my lazy boy and I'm just relaxing in the spirit. And that relaxing in the spirit means you do what he tells you to do. You obey him wholly. You let him have complete control over your life. And he puts you in a resting position. Just rest the meet you. You ain't got to do nothing. I got it. <laughs> it's already done. When he was on the cross, he said, it is finished. When you get filled with the Holy Ghost, now, now you've been baptized and it's finished. You can rest in him. Rest in him is obeying his word. So if you got John 14, we're going to start at um, verse 15. We're going to read down. This is John 14 and 15. It says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Simple. He didn't say, if you love me, give a million dollars to a church. He didn't say, if you love me, go on an 80-day fast. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. <clears throat> and I will pray the Father, and he should give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him not. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and he shall be in you. And I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more. But ye see me, because I live, ye shall also live. And now this comforter that he's mentioning to us is the Holy Ghost. We need it. We need it's, it's so vital that you get filled with the Holy Ghost. If you don't got it, even if you feel, well, I think I got it. No, you got to be in the surety that you have it. Peter said, make your calling and election sure. Make sure you got it. If you even feel like, well, maybe I have it. Let me get down and pray for it. It's simple. And when he give you that confidence, when I tell you everything that's about God, with God, for God, it's all in that confidence. That's how I can relax right now. I'm just resting in Jesus. I'm just resting in his commandments. I'm just doing what he tell me to do. And that has made my life so much simpler. My wife can pick my, my wife, her birthday is the passcode to my phone. My birthday is the passcode to her phone. So anytime she can pick my phone up and go through it, I have nothing to hide. Nothing. I go on my job, I'm holy. I come home, I'm holy. I go to Walmart by myself. I'm holy everywhere I go. That's the mindset. We have to change the way we look at God's word and say that we can accomplish this. I may not ever be a millionaire in life. I'm not sad about it. <laughs> I may not ever make 100000 a year, and I'm not sad about it. But my contentment is that I know him. We are, we like, me and Jesus is like this. <laughs> we like this. You know, the, the Lord appeared to Ezekiel and he gave Ezekiel this vision. And in this vision, it was four beasts and it was a wheel. <laughs> and he said that they, they moved so in sync together that it was like a wheel in the middle of a wheel or something. It was like that. Everywhere the beasts go, the wheel went. And it was just compacted. And he gave Isaiah that, that vision. And even I'm giving you this vision now. That's how we should be with Christ. Christ should be the one leading us and we should right there behind him. Wherever he go, we go. And when our life is like that, it's peace. I got God's protection on me because I'm part of his kingdom. I'm one of his sons. That's the important. Know who you are in God. Don't let nobody rob you of identity. Don't let things of the world, don't let things in your past rob you of who you are. When you are a son of God, you have the same authority as the son of God. Jesus came and he walked in authority. He spoke with boldness. Jesus wasn't afraid of nobody. Pilate said, man, we're going to kill you. You can't take my life. I lay it down. That's how bold Jesus was. We have that same boldness dwelling on the inside of us. Don't let nobody tell you different. You got that same authority. But that's when you love him and you obey his commandments. If you are not loving him the way he tells you to love him, you're going to be iffy. You Well, I ain't got it, man. I ain't got that boys that preacher talking about. Love him and keep his commandments. That's, that's what he's telling you. Love me. If you love me, you're going to keep my commandments. And everything that I have access to, you have access to. Amen. We're going to go to, man, this, this is all beautiful. 
when, whenever y'all have free time, read, just read the book of John, the whole book. Just read the whole book. Because it, it, it's, it's such a beautiful gospel. And it's a gospel of love. It really shows you the, the characteristics of God through Christ. And likewise, we are supposed to show the world the same characteristics of Jesus through us. Amen. And we're going to go. We're still in the book of John. <laughs> and hallelujah. We're going to go to the first book of John. <clears throat> and we're going to start at uh, verse four. So the book of John, chapter one, verse four. Once you have a say, man. It says, in him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shining in darkness, and darkness comprehended it not. And there was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came, uh, the same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. Now, that John they're talking about is John the Baptist. He came to preach Jesus before Jesus was coming. He came to prepare the people for Jesus coming. He began to tell them, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And he began to prepare that way for the light. It says the same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not the light, but he was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which lighted every man that coming into the world. He was in the world and the world was made by him and the world knew him not. He came unto his own and his own received him not. And this is the part I want to get to. It says, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And now... That verse 12 is what I want to get to. That power that he gives us to become the sons of God. That's male or female, no matter what your gender is. God is calling you his son. It doesn't. So, so don't, oh, he's saying son. He didn't say daughter. God is calling you his son. <laughs> the Holy Ghost does not have a gender. <laughs> the Holy Ghost is looking for somebody to show itself strong in. Whether you're a man or a woman, it doesn't matter to the Holy Ghost. It's coming to bring sonship on the inside of you. It's coming to give you your seal to the kingdom. It's coming to show, you know, whenever, whenever, because we are in America, so we are considered Americans. Whenever we go to any other country, they can tell that we are Americans by our accent, by, by the things that we may say. Whenever, even my wife, she's from Louisiana. And so whenever I hear somebody from Louisiana talk, I can tell they're from Louisiana. And I said, like, what part of Louisiana are you from? Like, How you know from your accent? It's a really thick accent. You can tell that they're from Louisiana. I'm from the South. So I have a Southern draw sometimes when I speak, and people can tell that I'm from the South. And I'm, I'm using these examples to show you that when you got the Holy Ghost on the inside of you, when you got that power, people can tell that you are a son of God. It's not about how many words you say. Because I can come out, man, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian. And I'm cussing, beating people up, smacking people, living a double life, having a dual nature. You sure you're a Christian, Demetrius? People will question that. Demetrius, I, my wife, Demetrius, I saw a text in your phone from a woman saying some other stuff that's saying that you're not being. Are you sure you're a Christian? That's when you got to examine yourself <laughs> to know whether you be in the faith or not. Don't be so caught. Well, I, well, you know, my apostle is uh, John Bush, man. I, I tell body of Christ, man, and he's saved. I can't get into heaven on his coattail. <laughs> in the book of, uh, I believe it's in the book of Ezekiel, it says that. Though you could be Joe, Daniel, or Noah's son or daughter, that doesn't mean you're going to make it in because they made it in. Every tub got to sit on his own bottom. I can't blame, well, you know, my daddy was a drunk, so I'm a drunk. No. <laughs> it, that's also in the Old Testament. The children cannot say that their teeth are set on edge because the fathers have eaten sour grapes. I can't blame my mama for things that I decided to do on my own. <laughs> I can't. I picked that up. I did that. I touched it. It's my fault. It's me standing in the need of prayer. 
And you have to change it. Well, you know, my mama, she wasn't no good. So, and what? <laughs> and several people who didn't have good mamas and came out successful. What's your excuse? It's time for us to stop blaming other people for us not serving God the right way. You can look into the same perfect law of liberty. When I came to God, it's nine years ago, back in 2010. I can blame my mama for the things I was going through. I had to wake up, look in the mirror. The mirror is your fault. <laughs> you did this to you. <laughs> you made these bad choices. That's why your life is going in this direction that it's going in. Now it's time to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Do you want to serve God or not? And that's a question that we have to ask ourselves. If we, well, something, well, I don't. Do you want to serve God, yes or no? And you answer that question. And when I realized, man, okay, so give up this to gain all of this? Why not? <laughs> it's very simple. It's not a hard task to do because the sin is going to take you to hell. <laughs> How many of us want to go to hell by, by a show of hands? Just raise your hand if you want to go to hell. No hands raised in her, right? I don't see nobody hand go up saying that they want to go to hell. So your life needs to change if it's heading towards hell's direction. God is not up there saying, okay, well, you five, nine, you can get into heaven. You, you meet the height requirement. Um, you too dark. Yeah, we're going to send you to hell. Well, you kind of light. Yeah, you, you come up here. God is not doing that at the gate. We make that choice. We make our, we make our minds up whether you want to go to heaven or hell, and that's all up to you. So Joshua began to say, this, 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 I'm, uh, and I'm just giving y'all scriptures that, that Joshua began to say, this day I set before you life and death. Which one would you choose? That's the same option that's before us every day. Because I don't have to serve God every day of my life if I choose not to. But why not? <laughs> that's the real question. Why not? God has been so long suffering with me, so merciful unto me. Why not serve God for the rest of my days? And you don't have to live an up and down life in God. You can live consistently holy in God. You can start from a babe on up living all the way holy in God. Because babes in Christ are holy. A babe in Christ, uh, well, I'm, I'm trying to, no. A babe in Christ is holy. They just need a little training. Need a little teaching. But they still holy. My daughter, I, that's another little blessing in my life. I got to. A newborn daughter. Oh, she's so beautiful. She's so pretty. And, and, and my daughter, though she's a baby, she's already a woman. She just ain't growing up yet. She's already a woman. <laughs> she's a woman already. She just got to grow up. <laughs> That's it. And so a baby in Christ is already holy. That's why I'm telling you, don't let anybody rob you from the confidence that you have in God. Babes in Christ don't sin. When, you, when I got filled with the Holy Ghost, man, I wasn't thinking about no sin. I wasn't thinking about, oh, well, God, I want to go. It wasn't even in me. Why? I'm clean. That burden was lifted off my shoulders. I've learned how to rest in him. That's what I'm saying. Change your perspective. God is not weak. The Holy Ghost is not weak. When the Holy Ghost comes on the inside of you, it binds all that other stuff up and kicks it out. The Holy Ghost ain't gonna dwell in an unclean temple. You, we just read in the, we just read in John fourteen that the spirit of the world, the spirit of the truth, whom the world cannot receive. So if you still baffling with serving God or being in the world, you can't receive it anyway. <laughs> you cannot receive this spirit until your mind is made up to be a son of God. That's the ones He give it to. And and you know I was. On, on the way to church, I was talking with uh, Trey, and, and I was telling him, I said, you know, the horrible part about hell is not even really the fire and brimstone, honestly. It's part of it, but that's not the worst part of it. The worst part of it is that you have all the times in your mind when you actually could have been connected with God, and you could have escaped this death, and you chose not to. And now you're disconnected from God forever. And that's going to always play in your mind. Always, while you burn a fell for that, that thought, man, if I would have just listened to that preacher that one day he was saying, serve God, I wouldn't have to deal with this right now. 
And that's going to always play in your mind. Because when you go to hell, you got all the memories from this world still in your mind. You got all the stuff you did, all the little stuff that you, you could have just gave up. And that's why I'm why not give it up? Let it go. It ain't, doing, it ain't helping you anyway. The stuff I was doing in the world was not saving me. It was not making me a better person. It wasn't making me a better man at all. It wasn't. Why not give it up? You win all of this on this side. And you just giving up this. <laughs> That's it. You have an eternity with God. When you get filled with the Holy Ghost, this is an experience like no other experience. And it's overwhelming. That spirit will come and overtake you. And while it's overtaking you, it's cleaning out. It's, oh, get that out of there. You clean now. You, you don't have to, but uh, am I saved? Am I? No, you are clean. Thoroughly. The Holy Ghost comes in and does a renovation. <laughs> And when I say it does a renovation, it, it takes cussing out your mouth. It takes lying out your mouth. It takes stealing out your heart. You don't even get mad at people because you're full of God's spirit. <laughs> it don't even feel right to be upset with somebody when you feel with the Holy Ghost. It's like, man, for what? I got God, man. No, it's all right. You, you're fine. Honestly, man, for what? I got, I got the living God on my side. And just, just all in me. <laughs> It's all in me. It's keeping me alive. Paul began to say, we live, we move, we have our being in him. We don't have to do nothing outside of him. Nothing outside of It's all in him. And so when you have that perspective of God in your life, knowing that you are the son of God, you have that same authority as the son of God. Jesus gave it to us. That's why he began to tell us, hallelujah. Let's go to the book of Romans. I just want to let y'all know what's on the inside of y'all. That's all. <sighs> Hallelujah. And this is going to be the, uh, the book of Romans, chapter 8, verses 12. Verses, we're going to start at verse 12. We're going to read on down. <laughs> so Romans 8. Yeah, Romans chapter 8, verse 12. Once you get it, say amen. amen. Therefore, brethren, <clears throat> we are not debtors. We, therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. So once you start living holy, you don't owe your flesh nothing. The flesh is actually dead. Flesh has no mindset. The flesh can't do nothing. The flesh can't make you do nothing. You got all the control over the flesh. The flesh ain't going to move unless you tell it to. So you can't say, oh, my flesh wanted to do it. No, you wanted to do it. Examine yourself to know whether you be in the faith or not. Least you be reprobate. Examine you. Look at you. So if you do anything outside of the will of God, it's because you wanted to do it. <laughs> be honest with yourself. The Bible tells us that a transgression, that, that a transgression, I'm going to give you a, a breakdown of that definition. When you transgress, you disobey God's law. A transgression is an intentional act of rebellion against God. <clears throat> intentional act of rebellion against God is something you did on purpose. So don't lie to yourself and say, well, I didn't want to commit fornication. Why did you do it? Because I wanted to be honest with you. Be not deceived, for God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man sow it, that shall he also reap. If you sow to the flesh, out of the flesh you're going to reap corruption. He's like, I'm not deceived by your actions. That's how I tell if you love me or not. When you, because in order to commit fornication, you got to now take your, take your flesh that's dead outside of Christ, raise it up yourself, and go and do an act. In the book of Romans, it tells you, put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provisions for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. It tells you what to do. It tells you, don't make a provision for the flesh because you're going to go after that lust and try to fulfill it. And that flesh really is dwelling down to who you really are. Once you get in God, he cleans the soul up. He takes everything out of the soul. So, so that, that fornication that was there is gone. That lying that was there is gone. That deceitfulness that was there is gone. That madhouse spirit, you being angry, it's gone. He takes all that stuff out of you. Now it takes you to say, okay, well, I'm going to go. I still like being angry sometimes to show people. I hold. You picking that stuff back up. And now you crucifying Christ afresh. 
Now you putting Christ back on the cross. And okay, well, it wasn't, it wasn't finished yet with me. No, it's done. Leave that stuff down. It, it didn't help you anyway. It didn't boost you up. It didn't, it didn't. Me being prideful because before I got saved, that, that's one of my things that I was, I was very arrogant. I was cocky. I was conceited. I just thought I was God gifts to women. Tell you the truth. That, that, that's how I thought. I mean, I didn't have this in front of me, so I was in much better shape. I was smaller. And so I worked out every day. I made sure I had my hair cut. I made sure my waves were spinning 360. I, I stayed in the mirror with a brush. I was like, man, yeah, boy. I put my earrings in and I walk outside, sometimes without a shirt on, sometimes with a shirt on, because I was in such good shape. Just so girls can say, oh, hey. Like, yeah, yeah, you know, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, you know, you know, I'm just doing my thing, you know, they, they looking at me, okay, I'm about to, about to go add her to the team. And that was my mindset. So how does God take a man who thinks like that, who thought like that for so long and make him faithful to a wife? The Holy Ghost. <laughs> it's all by the Holy Ghost. It's all through his spirit. Uh, I, my philosophy before I came to Christ was how many days is a week? Seven? I can have seven girls a week. Keep them in rotation. One fall off, go pick up another one. That was my mindset. And that was nice. So it's easy for me to do. Oh, hey, how you doing? Oh, I'm doing fine. Oh, so you single? I mean, I got a boyfriend. They ain't got nothing to do with me. It's okay. He ain't got to know about us. I mean, but what if he find out? I'll be your friend. I had a girl boyfriend call me. Me talking to my girlfriend? Said, no, nah, we're just friends. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, man, you know. I said she asked me for relationship advice. So I give it to her. All the while in the back of my mind, like, boy, you, you stupid. <laughs> but that was my mindset. That was my heart. I was deceivable. I was deceiving. I was malicious. I was envious. I'm like, man, they got a good relationship. Let me ruin it. That's how I thought. <laughs> Why not? I'm not married. I'm not tied down to anybody. And so my mindset before coming to Christ was I was a player. That was my whole thing. I was womanizing. That's, that's all I like to do. Fornication was, was my M.O. Every time I meet a girl, like, we're going to fornicate. She don't even know it. And she didn't. She wouldn't guess, oh, Demetrius is so polite. He's so nice. He always asks me how's my day. He always say great things about me. He, in her mind, she's thinking, well, he's husband material. In my mind, I'm like, eh, I'm not. But that's the way I thought. But only Christ can transform a man who fornicated every day, looked at pornography every day to now I don't even want to look at it. I don't even want to see anything that reminds me of it. I don't even care about it. I make, I make avenues. I make straight paths for my feet. They ain't even got a cross by it. Why? Wow, I'm delivered. <laughs> it did all happen in one moment. It did one a, a 10 year process of deliverance. When he put the Holy Ghost on the inside of me, I was delivered immediately. He took lying out of my lips. He took cussing out of my lips. He took those things out of my heart. And he could do the same for you. You don't have to come to church. Well, am I in the spirit? Am I not in the spirit? We are not debtors to the flesh. We owe the flesh nothing. Kill the old you. Mortify the deeds of your body. Kill it. Destroy it. And that's all about receiving the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Ain't God beautiful? He do that all in one motion. You know, in the moments of the twinkle out, you will be changed. <laughs> Can you blink? That's how fast the change takes place. It's not a long process. Apostle Bush can testify. He, he's a testimony of it. Ain't went back to the world. Been saved how long? 47 years. Look at that. 47 years, ain't went back to the dope, ain't went back to the women. Uh, a husband, a father, a great example. But why? Because he's looking up to Jesus, who's the author and finisher of his faith. And that, that's just my testimony. <laughs> that's just me sharing the testimony with y'all. Because God has truly delivered me. Amen. Hallelujah. And this is going to be... Um, we're going to go, go back to Romans 8, verse 12. Therefore, brethren, we are not debtors. <clears throat> we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if you through the spirit do mortify the, 
the deeds of the body, you shall live. For as many are as led by the spirit <clears throat> of God, they are the sons of God. And that's telling you who you are when you let the spirit lead you. That's why when the spirit says, suffer yourself to be defrauded, suffer yourself to be defrauded. When the spirit say you're wrong, hey, I'm wrong. Go out and apologize. It's easier that way. God can move that way. God can use you that way. It says, for real receive, not for ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. You see how good God is? All in one motion, he just made you, he just made you his son. Didn't take long. When Jesus said it was finished, it was done. It was finished. It's not a hard thing to comprehend. It's just we have to know that once we get filled with the Holy Ghost, boom, we got the spirit of adoption on the inside of us. Now God is our father also. And, <clears throat> and the spirit itself bear witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so, be that we suffer with him, that we also, that we, <laughs> that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And that's the mindset we have to have. Whatever we have to suffer and endure, it's not even worthy to be compared to the glory that's going to be revealed in us. So go through it. It's just making you more like God. When you have people who don't like you at your job and you still love on them anyway, that's making you more like God. When you have people who despise you, when you have friends who backstab you, Jesus went through that same thing with Judas. Judas followed Jesus for three years. <clears throat> In John 13, Jesus got down to watch, wash all of his disciples' feet. He didn't leave Judas out. He didn't backbite with the other disciples with Judas. This one of the sufferings of Christ. He knew that Judas was going to betray him because God told him. God told him that because he wanted to see his response. He wanted to, hey, if you my son, this man going to betray you. How you going to treat him? God told him that. How did he treat Judas? The disciples didn't even know that Judas was going to be the one that's going to betray him. He said, one of y'all are going to betray me. And they're like, who? He said, the one I get a sap to, he's the one that's going to. He gave it straight to Judas. And he treated Judas so well they still can tell. Oh, okay, well. He gave us, they still can see it. That's how well he treated Judas. So how well should, should we treat our backstabbers? How well should we treat our enemies? And that's just the sufferings of Christ. He began to endure those things. And when you begin to endure those sufferings like he did, the sufferings of Christ is not you deny yourself from sin. That's not a suffering of Christ because Christ didn't know any sin. He didn't sin. So he didn't, he didn't deal with fornication. But the sufferings of Christ is when you begin to take things that are handed towards you wrongfully. Because the Bible and, and Peter begins to say, if we're buffeted for our own faults, what glory is that? If I'm punished for something that I did, how, how does God get glory out of that situation? But if I'm being punished for something somebody else did, then Christ is glorified. And if we suffer for his sake, the Bible says, happy are ye. Because now we're part of his sufferings. Now we know that we are truly joint heirs with Christ. So when we begin to go through those, like Peter said, thinking not strange, because it's not a strange thing that's happened. It's not, oh, it's some oh God. Well, no, suffer it. Go through it. Paul just told you that it's not even worthy to be compared to the glory that's going to be revealed in us. Do you believe that? Can you truly see that God is going to reveal some glory from the inside of us? And those things we're going through, it's not even worthy to be compared to it. And so having that mindset that you have to have to actually become the son of God. And, and man, hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm going to go to one more scripture, then I may end. I got a lot of scriptures over here. <laughs> a lot of scriptures. But I just want us to really, truly take on the mind of Christ. Truly to be one with God, you have to have the mind of Christ dwelling on the inside of you. Hallelujah. My last scripture I'm going to go to is going to be the, it's a lot of good scriptures. Over it's going to be the uh, Gospel of John chapter 17. Amen. In, in the book of James, 
It says the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availing much. And how many of us believe that Jesus was a righteous man? <laughs> that Jesus was a man who did no sin. He was very righteous. And it says the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availing much. And this is Jesus praying for us, praying for his disciples in the Gospel of John chapter, chapter 17. Man, this is all good. But I'm trying to see where I should start it. Okay, we're gonna start it. Um we're gonna start at verse nine. And who Jesus, this is all really good. Just read the whole book of John. <laughs> read the whole book. The whole gospel. Just read the whole gospel. Don't skip. Don't jump around. Read the whole gospel. If I had time to read the whole gospel to you today, I would. It's so beautiful. And when we truly have God's perspective of his word and not just, the well, you know, my pastor said this. No. What did God say? What did God tell you? And here's Jesus praying for us. And Man, this is so good. Y'all pray for me. <laughs> So, so I'm uh, I'm gonna skip down. We're gonna start at uh, verse. I'm gonna say we're gonna start at verse 13. I know I said uh, nine, but we're gonna start at verse 13 for the second time. And he says, "And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word, <clears throat> and the world hath hated them." Because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them, keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they may also be sanctified through the truth. And so now <clears throat> we're here, Jesus praying. Like I said, he's praying for us. And he began to tell him that I don't want you to take them out of the world. That means we shouldn't be head off in the corner by ourselves, that we like monks or something, that we are all of us, we just gather in one corner. He didn't say he was going to take them out of the world, but he said, keep them from the evil that's in the world. And so our mindset has to be is that this ain't done in no corner. This ain't just going to be a group of us running to a corner. No, we still have to interact in the world. We still have to be that light, that example to the world so people may actually see how Jesus would be. That's what we can say. Don't take them out of the world. Just keep them from the evil. He says, neither, I, neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one as the Father art, <clears throat> as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they may, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one even as we are one. And that glory that Christ is speaking of is the Holy Ghost. Amen. And, they, and that's why it's important to have the Holy Ghost. The same glory that God gave Jesus, Jesus gave it to us. And that's the Holy Ghost. And, and, and that's my message. And I just want y'all to really grab a hold on to get the Holy Ghost. That's all, that's, that's all you need. Once you get the Holy Ghost, God going to handle the rest. Amen. So y'all can stand up on y'all feet as I call up my, my apostle, man. You know, such a great testimony, such a great example of a man of God. Amen.